First thing to point out is we can't think of climate change in isolation. Uh, when we think about it, we have to recognise it's linked to stratospheric ozone depletion, it's linked to biodiversity, water desertification, air quality and forestry. In other words, as the climate changes, it adversely affects each of these other issues. But in turn, changes in stratospheric ozone affect climate change. Changes in biodiversity and ecosystem services change by geochemical cycling feedback on the climate system. As we get desertification due to poor land use practices, it changes the albedo and exchange of water with the atmosphere and again affects climate change. So we have to start to look at this as one interlinked system where both the science is totally interlinked but therefore by definition so are the policies, technologies and behavioural changes we're going to need. I think the point to make is climate change and loss of biodiversity, and I am going to talk about them together because you can't separate them. Even though the conventions are separate, each, even though everyone talks about them separately, I really don't think we should. But it doesn't matter whether it's climate change or loss of biodiversity, degradation of ecosystem services, they're both environmental, they're development, and they're security issues. They both affect food, water and human security, both affect our economy, they both undermine our ability to alleviate poverty, they both have adverse effects on human health and they both affect security at the personal, national and regional level. They're both inter and intra-generational equity issues. It's the industrialised world that's largely caused the problem and um, but effectively it's people in developing countries that are by far the most vulnerable and whatever we do today will affect not only this generation but will affect generations to come. And so on climate change, what are the key indirect drivers? And they're exactly the same drivers whether it's biodiversity or whether it's climate change. Um, it, they're economic, they're demographic, socio-political, cultural, religious, science and technology within the climate change system it manifests itself by increases in greenhouse gases so the more you've got economic growth the more you have demographic change between those two the number of people and their ability to purchase and in this case purchase energy uh, leads effectively to the demand for energy then depending on the science and technology depends on how we produce and how we use that energy so a combination of those indirect drivers affect greenhouse gas emissions which in turn affect climate change. If this was biodiversity, I'd have the uh, same indirect drivers, but for direct drivers, I would have exploit over-exploitation of resources. I'd have conversion of ecological systems. I'd have climate change as a driver. I'd have pollution as a driver and invasive species. And so with climate change, there's absolutely no question we have changed the composition of the atmosphere. And there's no question it's due to human activities. And um, so what are we seeing? We're seeing increased uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases which warm the atmosphere, aerosols that tend to cool the atmosphere. <clears throat> Not only have they increased to date, <clears throat> it's absolutely inevitable, they continue to increase. We've already seen warmer temperatures, further changes in temperature are absolutely inevitable. Changes in precipitation patterns, it's not only just the amount of precipitation, it's the type of precipitation. And that is a question, is what we have already observed and we expect in the future is far more heavy precipitation events, less light precipitation events, higher sea levels, retreating mountain glaciers, melting of the Greenland ice sheet, reduced Arctic sea ice, both in the extent and the thickness, uh, in particular in summer, but also starting to sit in winter, and more extreme weather events. This shows you the very famous uh, Keeling uh, graph from Mauna Loa, show it when he started the observations in 1958. And since then, as you can see, year on year, it's been monotonically going up. There are many sites like this now around the world. The reason you see little wiggles is actually given that Mauna Loa is in the Northern Hemisphere. In the summer, you draw down the carbon dioxide due to the growth of that vegetation and in the winter you get respiration where the vegetation dies. So you get an annual pattern uh, superimposed on the increase. And as you can see, in the first few years, for say 1958 to 1965, went up about 1.3 uh, parts per million per year. Now it's going up actually at more than 2.2 parts per million. This finished in 2007. It now actually is around 390 something parts per million, increasing at about 2.5 parts per million. So there's no question, since 1990, when we indeed did have the, or 1992 I should say, when we had the first uh, convention and the statements in Rio, uh, we've actually had a faster rate of increase of carbon dioxide uh, since Rio than we had before Rio. Uh, clearly we are not getting to grips with this particular problem. 
Um, this actually shows you over the very long time scale and as you can see for carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide from the year 1000, 1000 years ago till today, pretty flat until we hit the industrial revolution around 1850 and after about 1850 we saw increases in carbon dioxide due to a combination of the way we produce energy and the way we use it, the combustion of coal, oil and gas. Um, we also, some of that is due to deforestation as well. Methane has largely gone up because of the, uh, rice production and livestock production, uh, both producing uh, methane and nitrous oxide, a combination of nitrogen fertilizers and a number of other uh, uh, products. So all three of these greenhouse gases have gone up significantly. Equally, uh, the fluorocarbons also are greenhouse gases and contribute to climate change, albeit small compared to some of these. Uh, these. Uh, where, are the greenhouse, uh, where are the greenhouse gases coming from? Largely energy, but not exclusively. Power, transport, buildings and industry, uh, but land use and farming also quite significant. So for carbon dioxide, about 70% indeed is coming uh, from the, uh, what I'd call the energy sector. But deforestation, the numbers vary, to be quite honest. I wouldn't take the decimal points at all seriously. But between a combination of land use change, largely deforestation in the tropics, and agriculture, it's about 30%. So when people say we've got to get to grips with the energy sector, they're right. But we cannot forget uh, the uh, land use and farming. This simply shows you the per capita emissions of fossil fuel emissions, basically, in 2007 on the left, and the cumulative emissions, 1750 to 2007 on the right. And as you can see, in 2007, uh, uh, USA and Canada dominate. Uh, India, not insignificant. Russia, of course, quite significant. And so are the other industrialized countries like the United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. Now, at this moment in 2012, the total emissions from the USA and China are roughly comparable. If anything, China is slightly ahead of the US, but it's still at least a four to one ratio uh, in their per capita emissions, uh, largely because of, of course, the, a larger population in China. So when people say China is the big problem, I think we have to recognize um, that indeed, on an absolute scale, they're now the largest emitter. On a per capita, they're actually still less uh, than all most of Europe and certainly less than China, uh, USA and Canada. If you look at the cumulative emissions, so when you try and negotiate an international agreement, people say, ah, it's not just the current emissions that we should worry about, what's the historical contribution to greenhouse gas emissions? And I have some sympathy for that, in the sense that we're using the carrying capacity of the Earth. And so to some degree, you have to not only look at total emissions, per capita emissions, but even some of the historical emissions. And when you do that, even China today, with its massive emissions, is relatively insignificant compared to the US, United Kingdom, etc. So these are some of the reasons of complexity. The other th point we should point out is, at face value, the UK is doing really, really well uh, since 1990. And that is, we've reduced our emissions of carbon dioxide equivalent, that is, taken into account carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, and we've reduced our emissions about 20, 22%. A real success given that under the Montreal Protocol, we were told that we only had to reduce about 12%, part of the European bubble. However, if we take embedded carbon into account, that is to say the carbon embedded in imports and exports, where we get a credit for the exports, but we get a debit for the imports, we haven't actually reduced our emissions, our effective emissions, by 22%. They've increased 18% the worst performance in all of Europe. And that started about 1995, and it's continued to this day. Uh, so it actually doesn't matter who's been in power, whether it be Labour or Conservatives, monotonically, we have not what, done one iota to really reduce our carbon footprint. And as I say, we're actually the worst in Europe when you actually look at the issue of embedded carbon. So why, is China's emission, why are China's emissions going up? Probably, and the numbers are a bit squishy, and so don't take them too hard, but probably about 60% of their rate of emission increases now is due to domestic use, but 40% is what they're exporting to Europe and North America. And so one has to actually, so what we've done in the UK is we've exported our footprint, very straightforward.
Um, if effectively you actually look at that sort of, so, so you want cumulative emissions, so it's actually a combination of emissions per capita and cumulative population, and this is just another way of looking at it. And if you actually look at the US and you look at China now, if you integrate under the boxes, they're about the same. Um, this effectively uh, looks at the other, another issue, which the US and others argue should take, be taken into account. It's a fair point, and that is effectively GDP uh, per unit of CO2 emissions. And what one sees, and it's not, not surprisingly, the more industrialised countries are getting more GDP per unit of CO2. In other words, uh, developing countries are tending to use their energy much less efficiently, and that's actually why, in some respects, the international carbon system, the trading system, makes sense, because you can reduce emissions in a country such as India and China much more cost-effectively than you could reduce them in the US or in Europe or in Japan, where we tend to use emissions uh, like carbon much more effectively. So uh, this actually points to where you could get, indirectly points to where you can get uh, emissions reduction in the most cost-effective way. Clearly what we're doing is, due to energy production and use, due to deforestation, due to agricultural activities, we're putting more carbon dioxide as well as methane nitrous oxide into the Earth's atmosphere. Some of it stays in the atmosphere, some gets reabsorbed by the land, some gets reabsorbed uh, by the oceans. But effectively, about half, and it's a rough number, about half stays into the atmosphere. Hence, we're seeing an increase in carbon dioxide year on and year out, as you saw uh, from the slide from Mauna Loa that Ke Keelan started. As we change the amount of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases, we change the radiative balance of the atmosphere. Very simply, when you put these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, they act as a blanket. They allow the sun's rays to come all the way to the Earth's surface, they don't change that. But then uh, the, the solar radiation we get in gets reflected back to space um, as infrared radiation, and some of that gets absorbed by these, uh, this blanket of greenhouse gases and some of it is re-radiated back to Earth, and hence all it is is a blanket. So the more greenhouse gases we put into the Earth's atmosphere, the more we would expect the Earth to warm up. And this is where effectively the sceptics that say uh, they don't believe in the greenhouse effect is blatantly stupid. It is the most simple physics you can come across. Now you do have to think through the positive and the negative feedback effect, but fundamentally, if you increase greenhouse gas emissions, you would expect the Earth's climate to change and it would become warmer. The reason that Mars is so cold, almost no greenhouse gases, the reason that Venus is a sweltering hothouse is because it's got a lot of uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in the, in the system. So the greenhouse effect is very simple physics. Quantifying exactly the impact of the greenhouse gas is tricky, which is why we need sophisticated models because of the so-called feedback effects. So as we put carbon dioxide, methane and the other gases in there, you change the so-called radiative balance and this just shows you a change in what we call radiative forcing. So the carbon dioxide has increased the radiative forcing about 1.6 watts per square metre. At methane, nitrous oxide and our helicarbons together about 1, so that gives us about 2.6. Um, tropospheric ozone, uh, a pollutant as we know, there's a problem both in urban and rural environments, uh, has also increased it by maybe about another 0.4. Stratospheric ozone depletion is a little negative effect, but now we're up to, about, uh, now we're up to something like about 3 watts per square metre. But we've also polluted our atmosphere uh, with aerosols. And that is what you see there, total aerosols, there's a so-called direct effect, fairly easy to calculate and a so-called cloud albedo, or an indirect effect, much harder to calculate. Those two together probably add up to about 1.4. We've seen some change in surface albedo as well. So an interesting thing is, the total net anthropogenic effect, which is down at the bottom there, that little guy there, is almost identical to CO2 on its own. In other words, there are other pollution, primarily sulphate aerosols, have actually offset the effect of methane, nitrous oxide, the halo carbons, and ozone. Um, and so in reality, we've changed our radiative balance by about 1.6 watts per square metre, but it's only 1.6, not 3, because of the so-called indirect effect of the aerosols. In other words, one form of pollution is offsetting another form of pollution. Not a particularly sensible thing. If indeed India and China 
start to desulfurize their coal like we did in North America, both the US and Canada, and in Europe because of acid deposition, this offset will disappear. We, we, we will suddenly be up to a three watts per square meter, even today, if they were all to disappear. So the Earth's climate is being protected by another form of pollution, and this, I've already said that. So if you look over time what's happened, and this is our CO2, our methane nitrous oxide, you can see the radiative force and has gone up and up, and you'd end up, as I've suggested by my simple calculation, about three watts per square meter. But there is a direct effect of that, I mean, yeah, the direct and indirect cooling effect, which you can see here and there, pushes it down to much more, uh, so this suggests sort of closer to 1.9, I said 1.6, but clearly suppress it. So that pollution is safeguarding an even bigger uh, climate change than we would otherwise be seeing to today. Though this shows you effectively the climate, the temperature, the temperature is going up and the warmest temperatures uh, have all occurred from 1990 to 2007. If you bring all the global temperatures together, uh, the black line is the observed global number, the black line global land surface temperature change, ocean and then region by region. If you then compare what we've observed, the black lines, to theoretical climate simulations, then if you only take into account natural phenomena, changes in solar radiation, changes in volcanic activity, you get the blue line in each case. And I would hesitant say the blue line doesn't fit the black line. If we take into account, however, both natural phenomena, solar and volcanic, and the greenhouse gases, and the aerosols, and land use change, and changes in the stratospheric ozone, you get the orangey pink colour, and I would say at the global level and at the regional level, there's broad agreement. This and other information, what, it, what led the IPCC to say in a fourth assessment report, that most of the observed change in temperature in the last 50 years is due to human activity. The other way to say, which is even more powerful, it cannot be explained by natural phenomena. So what about the future? This actually shows you the implications of a low emission scenario, a medium emission scenario, and a high emission scenario. This is the global average shown in here for the 2020s or the 2080s, and for, sorry, 2090s I should say. And this shows you uh, as a function of latitude and longitude. The key thing to note, and I'd focus on these maps over here, low emissions, medium emissions, and high. What do I note? The land areas warm more than the oceans. The darker the colour, the more it's warmer. Land warms more than the ocean, and the high latitudes warm more than the equatorial region. But these three are almost identical. Why? Very simple. The, the Earth's climate of the 2020s and probably most of the 2030s is already preordained. Doesn't matter what we do about greenhouse gas emissions now, it's the past emissions that will control our climate for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Therefore, by definition, we've already seen about a 0.8 degree Celsius rise globally. We're already committed to at least another 0.5, that takes us to 1.3, maybe even another 0.7, that takes us to 1.5 compared to pre-industrial. That's inevitable. Therefore, we will absolutely have to adapt whatever we do to mitigate. But if we don't mitigate to try and go from the high to medium and preferably low, we're going to see these sort of changes by the 2090s. And as you can see, when you go to low to medium and high, there is no question the projected changes in climate are much more severe in a high emissions case than the medium and the low. Therefore, we must mitigate and we must adapt. There is no question. And the best adaptation strategy is to mitigate so you don't have to adapt to a significant change in temperature. So we've got a very serious issue facing us. This actually shows you what could happen. This is the UK CPO9 projections. This is just simply for the medium emissions in the decade of the 2080s. And you can see what it suggests for the UK is typically four or five degrees warmer as a 50-50 shot. Uh, but if, you, if we're lucky and we did an uncertainty analysis, there's a 10% chance it'll only be one to two. But there's also a 10% chance it could be 8, 9, or, eight, nine, or 10. Uh, clearly, potentially very, very severe. 
Um, we all remember the last time we had a summer was 2003, um, and effectively in 2003 it was much warmer than the average, but not by that much. And the 2003 that caused up to 50,000 deaths, I think the number in Europe is somewhere between 30 and 50, and in the UK between maybe two and three, that very, very hot summer of 2003, it would be a very, very average summer by about 2040, and actually be a fairly cold summer uh, by the 2060s. So even though it was very warm in that year, effectively it's actually going to be very common if in the decades to come. Uh, precipitation much, much harder to project, but the general picture, this is for December, January, February, this is for June, June July, August, the picture fundamentally is more precipitation in the high latitudes of both hemisphere, maybe more precipitation in the equatorial region, but the subtropics will definitely dry out, including southern Europe, significant drying out uh, either side of the equator. Uh, for the UK, what we would project is annually average, not much change in precipitation at all, a few percent, up to 10%, one way or the other. Uh, more rainfall in winter, just a little bit, a bit less in summer. If I look at winter and then I look at summer, winter, what it suggests here is that winter will become on average maybe about 30% wetter. Not much evidence from last winter and this winter. So you could say, are oh, we totally wrong? Well, you get, you get year to year and decade to decade variations. So this is not to suggest the two dry winters in a row, uh, we've got it all wrong. Uh, but if indeed we go to a 10%, there's a 10% chance of only maybe 10 or so percent w w wetter, but also a, a chance could be up to 30, 40% wetter, maybe even 50. What about the summer? Well, the summer we would project would become drier, potentially 10 to 30%, 50-50 shot. But there's a 10% chance, actually, it could be just a tad wetter. There's also a chance it could be anywhere from 30, 40, 50, even 60% drier. So these are uncertainty analysis. So when we think through what are the implications for agriculture, water resource management, I don't think you can blindly think of what I call the central value of either temperature or precipitation. You need to take, think through what if we're either lucky or unlucky, what would it do to your strategy? So why do we care about climate change? Well, simply, on, a, on average, bad adverse effects. There's a few positives, but the vast majority of effects are ne negative. Decreased water availability, decreased uh, water uh, quality, increased risk of floods, both in the same region. So in the same region of the Earth, in a given year, you could get both more floods and more droughts because of more heavy precipitation, less light precipitation. Decreased agricultural production, and we're already seeing it, productivity, for any warming in the tropics and subtropics. However, we in the UK will get a longer thermal growing season, earlier springs, later at winters. That can be good, I would argue, up to maybe two or three degrees Celsius, and after that likely to be negative, but also depends incredibly on what will happen to precipitation, both the amount and the seasonal variability, what will happen to other extreme events. And so a bit more complex, especially for the UK to think through. But no question, overall, in the very places we have hunger and famine today, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Latin America, parts of Asia, uh, it will indeed lead to potentially more hunger. Increased incidence of vector, that's malaria, dengue, waterborne, cholera, heat stress, mortality, threats to nutrition, so adverse health effects, and effectively adverse effects on ecological systems. So this is where I've gone well away from what I was asked to talk about. Why do we care? I've already talked about this. The indirect drivers of climate change are the same indirect drivers as I showed for climate. As I mentioned before, these are the direct drivers from habitat change. Ah, look, we've got climate change here. Invasive species over-exploitation and effectively nutrients and pollution, all affecting biodiversity loss. This comes out of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that I was the board co-chair. So here are the five uh, factors that lead to loss of biodiversity. These are a series of ecosystems. So we looked at a, uh, three forested systems, four dryland systems, uh, some aquatic systems. The colour says whether or not a driver in the last 100 years was major. So dark red means it was a very important driver, yellow means it wasn't very important. So for example, habitat change 
was a major driver of change of tropical forest, deforestation, also a major driver of temperate grasslands as we turned them into agriculture. Major implications are habitat change on inland and coastal waters. So the colour tells you whether it's a major factor, still important high, medium and low. The direction of the arrow tells you what we project over the next 50 years. And so in the habitat change, uh, if it goes up it's going to get worse, going down it's actually getting better. So you see a variety and if it goes horizontal it probably stays the same. Look at what we say for climate change. Most of it was yellow up to now. That means it was not, climate change has not been a major driver compared to the other drivers in the last 50 to 100 years. But we would project it may well be the major driver uh, over the next 50 or more years. And if we don't get to grips with pollution, nitrogen, sulfur and phosphorus, we're also going to have a major problem on biodiversity due to pollution as well. So climate change is a major player in biodiversity loss, not in the past, but almost certainly in the future. Why do we care about biodiversity? Well, there's lots of reasons. It's the provisioning services, the provisioning of crops, livestock, fisheries, etc. And they all play largely in the marketplace. So we value our provisioning services. In fact, what we've done in the UK since the Second World War is to maximise our provisioning services, our provisioning of food and livestock, in order that we became, um, we could uh, have cheap food. Uh, very valuable. But we don't value in the marketplace the way it moderates climate, hazards, uh, uh, purification of our water, uh, pollination services. We don't value often some of our cultural services other than recreation and we don't value our supported services. So the reason we're losing biodiversity and we're degrading our ecosystems is only some of the provisioning services and a couple of the cultural services such as recreation have market value. The challenge effectively is, as I'll say later, we've got to value all of these services. And so what have we done? Well, historically, if we go back, you know, four or five hundred million years, we've seen some major mass extinctions, all caused naturally from one reason or another. And the last one was 65 million years ago. We are currently entering another mass extinction. And in fact, we have entered the sixth mass extinction. The difference is this time it's not natural, it's caused by human activities. So climate change, another issue is food security. Is it an issue? Well, there's no question whatsoever. Agriculture currently consumes 70% of all fresh water uh, withdrawals from rivers and aquifers. Totally and utterly unsustainable in most parts of the world. Even today, 30 to 35% of agricultural um, irrigation practices are unsustainable. With climate change, it's going to be even worse. Agriculture, as I've already said, contributes globally, not in the UK, but globally, 10 or 12 12 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Extensification, where we expanded our agricultural land, has led to a loss of biodiversity and degrading ecosystems. And we've degraded our aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, uh, acidification, eutrophication. So how well are we doing? Well, we're not doing very well on food globally. Um, in 1970, we had almost just under 900 million hungry people stayed pretty constant. In the last two years it's gone up over a billion people. Uh, largely due to some price shocks for a number of reasons which I won't go into, uh, but potentially one of them being human-induced climate change. Had major droughts in 2008 in both uh, Australia and the US. Food shortages, uh, especially food crops, but also crops for, uh, to, for animal feed. And suddenly the price went up for some of the crops by almost a factor of two and so more people were put into food poverty, basically. The percentage of hungry people has gone down. I mean, you could say this is a success down from 24% down to 14 now maybe 15%, but it's still a billion people go to bed hungry every night. The demand for food will double within the next 25 to 50 years. People will demand a higher quality food. Why do we need it? To feed the world, to enhance rural, rural livelihoods. Most poor people in sub-Saharan Africa Many of them live in the rural areas and they depend on an agricultural system one way or another for their livelihoods. And a significant number of Af sub-Saharan African countries, more than 25% of their GDP is effectively in agriculture. So we need it to stimulate economic growth. But we need to do all this in an environmentally and socially acceptable manner. But then if you look at agriculture, it's right in the middle 
of this thing. Effectively, as we use nitrogen fertilisers, <coughs> it affects climate. But as we affect climate, both the temperature and the hydrological cycle, it will, in most cases, the parts of the world, as I've said, adversely affect our ability to produce. But also, as we extensify, we cut down our forests, we convert our grasslands. Uh, when you cut down the forest, you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as I've already said, affects climate change, back feeds on food. You also lose the wild relatives. You lose species and genetic diversity. You lose the wild relatives that we, wait, that we may well need to adapt to a changing climate. As we till our land and we use our irrigation unsustainably, we get land degradation, uh, we get salinization of soils, we lose soil nutrients, uh, and effectively undermines our ability to affect food. So once again, climate change comes in directly through the use of fertilizers, comes indirectly through extensification, carbon dioxide emissions, etc. And also, as you get warmer temperatures, it also can lead to land degradation and again undermines our ability uh, to produce food. Um, this I won't dwell on. Uh, it's going to be a major challenge to double the, to feed, a major challenge to, to meet the doubling demand of food when we'll have less labour, less water. Yield increases are slowing dramatically. We've got less arable land through competition, roads, buildings, but also bioenergy. Land policy conflicts, not obviously an issue so much in the US, UK, but certainly in developing. And then three environmental issues, quite clearly. This shows you it's a medium production. This is what we call a medium uh, world. This is medium population growth, medium economic growth. We've actually done it for high economic growth and low population. We've done it for high population, low economic growth. But this is what I call a middle scenario for the next 50 years. Medium, emission, medium population, medium economic growth. And this is what we think will happen to maize prices, rice prices and wheat. 50% um, increase in maize in real terms. 30% in rice, just a bit less for wheat. But if we take climate change into account, it literally doubles it. In other words, the maize prices, if you take climate change into account, we think will literally double. The, the bar here shows the uncertainty between a minimum and maximum effect due to four climate scenarios. In other words, small climate change, large climate change. But what you can see is climate change comes really in into the potential price of food in the future. We need to understand the genomics of plants. We need it in order to understand how crops grow, whether we use it for classical plant breeding or GM. I am totally agnostic on GM. I think we need to do research, we need to do field trials, but whether we should ever grow for, uh, crops commercially, I think is a question depending on the risks and the benefits in the future. We need to understand the genomics even for classical plant breeding. Um, why would we want to do that? Well, if you could, if you could convert or have some of the same traits as a C4 plant rather than a C3, it would help to improve productivity, more drought resistance, good for uh, ad adapting to climate change, temperature resistance, pest tolerance, and very importantly, enhanced nitrogen use efficiency. And this just simply says some of the issues you'd have to take into account uh, if you were to ever consider uh, genetic modification, health, environmental issues, the role of companies and intellectual property rights, uh, and this whole issue of poor farmers being very dependent on the mul large multinationals. But that's a whole separate talk. Water security, major issue. Uh, water security is growing. We would estimate by 2025 more than half the world would live in an area of that severe water stress. Uh, water quality already declining. And as I said down here, human-induced climate change is going to make this situation even worse. Human security, interesting issue here, and that is the countries in grey are the ones that are the largest per capita emitters and have, who are causing and have caused human-induced climate change. North America, Europe, uh, Russia. The ones in red are effectively the ones that are most vulnerable. As you can see, they're completely anti-correlated. Those that have caused the problem are not the ones to suffer. Those that didn't cause the problem are the ones that will most likely suffer. This is why, again, the Climate Convention is so hard to negotiate. There's major ethical and equity issues and moral issues in this particular issue. An interesting question is, will it change conflict or not? Tens of millions of people could be displaced in small island states, low-lying deltaic areas. So all the small uh, low-lying uh, Pacific islands, the Maldives, Kiribati, 
Highest part above sea level, one meter. We're likely to hit that within 100, maximum 200 years. Food shortage is where we've got hunger and famine today, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Water shortage, where we've got water shortage, sub-Saharan Af sub Africa. Natural resources, where poor people depend on them, much of the tropics and subtropics. Increase of disease, where they don't have healthcare facilities. Same, developing countries around the tropics and subtropics. Therefore, climate change, coupled with other stresses, not on its own, coupled with other stresses, could lead to local and regional conflict and could lead to in-migration and out-migration, depending on the social, economic and political circumstances. Something that really hasn't had enough attention to it, it's getting more and more attention, but it's something that we at least need to think about. There's a really, really interesting analysis in the United States done by the CIA and done by, because I was on a panel, a CIA panel, and also done by the military. They view this as a really potential serious issue. Has not translated itself to the politicians in the Senate and the House, though. Okay, so what we need to do, and I'll try and rush along here now, the politicians have argued we should try and, and so are the NGOs, not just politicians, that we should try and limit to two degrees Celsius. Agree fully. Most of us are nothing there. Both politicians and NGOs would actually prefer it to be less than two. But a pragmatic number is two relative to pre-industrial because as you go further and further, more and more adverse effects on food, water, ecosystems and extreme weather. What are the chances of two? Very straightforward, zero. I would actually put it as bluntly as zero. In a paper that I've just written with uh, 20 other Blue Planet laureates, this is the Ashley Glass Prize, uh, so it's got people like Nick Stern, Bob May, Jose Goldenberg, that won three, uh, was uh, th three times as a minister, three different ministries in Brazil, Emil Saling, who was the environment minister, um, some very, very other interesting people. Uh, our paper suggests, with current commitments, we're on a 50-50 shot of three, and if anything, a likely possibility of four and five. But 50-53, and you can't rule out four and five. At four and five, very, very serious implications for food, water, ecosystems, etc. So what do we need to do? This comes from Nick Stern's report. We need to put a price on carbon. There's a series of uh, uh, approaches. We need technology transformation. I would not call it revolution. I'd call it transformation. Carbon capture and storage, renewable energy, wind, solar, possibly wave at power. Um, Future generation biofuels, not current biofuels, that's displacing our food other than sugar in Brazil. And definitely better use of our own, end use efficiency, absolutely critical. But equally, we need behaviour change. We need to understand behaviour and we don't. We need, to, we need to get into the minds of citizens, business and governments. With, you can have all of, all of the prices you want, all of the technologies, but behaviour change is just as important. Uh, very straightforward, we need more efficient production use. Fuel shift, coal to gas could be good. I've mentioned renewable energy, carbon capture and storage. Tons of rhetoric around most governments of the world for the last 20 years. We haven't got one meaningful carbon capture and storage project in the United Kingdom at the moment, and we're only just getting a few around the world. We need 20, probably between 10 and 20 large scale studies done, pilots done throughout Europe. Not just the UK, we need international collaboration, preferably with the US, preferably with China. Nuclear, well after the Japanese incident, uh, Germany has now banned it, J Japan's now rethinking its nuclear strategy. Uh, I'm actually more positive than negative on nuclear, to be quite honest. But I don't think we can go to a low carbon economy without at least one of these two being in the mix. I just don't see getting there purely on the others. Unless we've got so much shale gas and then the question is, is it environmentally sound? Um, and that's a real question on shale gas at the moment. And we've got to deal with our forests at the same time. This simply shows you the behavioural change issue. A segmentation analysis, very, very interesting. You've got things like positive greens and con uh, concerned consumers. Between the two, over 30%, about a third of our population. Yep. And then we looked at ability to act, willingness to act. You only have to give these guys information. That's all they really need, basically. But then there's some more stall starters and the sideline guys. They might be willing to act, especially the sideline supporters, but they don't have an ability, so they might need some financing. 
But then you get the honestly disengaged. I've got a very different word for these guys. They really don't care. The only way you can get to these guys is through regulation. So by doing these sort of segmentation analysis, you know where, which, which part of society you can get to for information, which part you can get to with financial incentives, and which part you get to by regulation. We have to be quite honest. Adaptation is important, it's needed, but there are physical, behavioural and technological limits and there are financial limits and we should recognise that. We need a long-term framework, we need a long-term goal. I really don't see this personally doing it sector by sector. But if the only way we can get there is sector by sector, that's fine. I have a personally a really hard time seeing voluntary working. I do believe we need a global agreement with all major emitters but taking into account the equity issues that I talked about, should the emission reduction, say, for India, let alone small developing countries or poor developing countries, be the same as the US or Europe, so we have to think through the equity issues. Uh, we do need to develop carbon markets to be efficient. We need an evolution of technology. We need adaptation. We mustn't forget how to manage our land, and we've got to bring in aviation and shipping. If we want to deal with that biodiversity, it's very st straightforward to me. We've got to get the economic system right. We need to value all ecosystem services, not just those bought and sold in the market. We need to reduce subsidies for agriculture, fisheries and energy. We should pay landowners not only to produce, say, fibre or food, but pay them for ecosystem services, i.e. <coughs> pillar, pillar two of the common agricultural policy. We need appropriate white water pricing positive. When you've got a scarce resource, if you don't price it, it's going to be wasted. It's a very major ethical issue in developing countries, as I knew as chief scientist of the World Bank. But there are social safety nets you can put in place, so you don't have to make it a true economic value or market value, but you do have to price it, otherwise you end up wasting it. There's other approaches of fees and taxes, market mechanisms, and of course environmental technologies. Um, if we want to do look at water, we need both an ecological principle, an institutional principle, and the instrument principle. And once again, water pricing comes in here quite clearly. And for agriculture, we've got to embed economic, environmental, and social sustainability into agriculture. We can address today's hunger problems with current technologies. We don't need advances in science and technology. They will be valuable to deal with climate change, new pests and diseases, the challenge of doubling the meeting the doubling of demand. Advanced biotechnology may be needed, but we have to look at the risks and benefits, and they have to be absolutely fully understand. Payment for ecosystem services. We need to absolutely reform international trade, get away from subsidies, uh, whether it be in the pillar one in the U EU or uh, what's happening in the US. And we need to invest. In conclusion, the uh, world is long on rhetoric, short on action, uh, both for climate change and biodiversity. We're seeing climate change now occurring at the fastest rate ever. We're seeing biodiversity loss at an unprecedented rate, faster than the last 65 million years. We need to address these issues by intertwining the three pillars of sustainability. But they're not three separate pillars, they're like a DNA, they've got to be brought together. And so we need to look at the economic, environmental and the social issues together. We need to get the right mix of policies, practices and technology and behaviour change. And I think the problem is we have not sold this to the public, or these two issues of the public, as a true major challenge.